Um, kia ora koutou. My name is Marian Tan, and I, I am a social scientist from the Joint Center for Disaster Research at Massey University. My special interest is really looking at warnings and technology and how they can hinder or help people in making effective decisions during crisis situations. Um, but warning and technology is really just only a small portion of what I will talk about today. And what I will share to you is a wider work from our research center, especially from the works of Professor David Johnson and Dr. Lauren Vinell, and, any, uh, and all other associated research on the social aspects of tsunami evacuation, which I have heard from the Correro that we've had um, so far. Um, so how do we behave in tsunami events? And I'll share a little bit of insights on why people evacuate as well. But I think to answer this question is we look at our past experiences. And I'm going to draw us back to 1960. OK, 1960, because this is the largest evacuation event that has happened here in New Zealand. Um, if, if anyone remembers, there, were, there was a huge earthquake off Chile at a 9.5 magnitude event. And tsunami hit New Zealand without warning. It was only three days later, on an aftershock, that um, some message from Honolulu to Wellington that we got to be warned of an oncoming tsunami, potentially from this aftershock. And this caused um, a lot of people to evacuate um, during that event. Uh, and this, this was nationwide. And so how did people actually um, uh, behave during this evacuation in 1960? So I'll show you a picture in Gisborne. <laughs> Um, so some people actually went to the shore to look at the tsunami, wanted to have a, have a little, little bit of viewing. Um, but it's not just in Gisborne where this behavior was observed. It's also ob observed in Napier, also observed in Auckland, in Dunedin, in Wellington. So this is a behavior that we no longer encourage now. That's it, right? <laughs> Right. So, but the truth is, a um, majority of people did evacuate, and um, there was a huge effort by the police to broadcast warnings for people to evacuate. But the thing is, it's like, even though people evacuate, they, some people do not heed the, the warning, and some people actually counter the warning, such as our tsunami tourists. So, uh, the, the question really is, you know, how do we uh, make things better for future, future events? So uh, it, it was a good thing that here in New Zealand, no lives were lost, although we did have some um, coastal damages in some properties and facilities. All right, so um, we have learned a lot since the 1960s. And, um, and after the event, the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center uh, was as formally established to provide a Pacific-wide um, tsunami, tsunami warning throughout the Pacific. We also developed um, educational uh, materials, also management tools. But sadly, from in between 1960 to 2004, 2004 um, our awareness and our um, ability to respond probably waned a little because there was no significant event in between those times. But so let's look at um, 2004, the Indian tsunami, ocean, Indian Ocean tsunami event. Okay, so I want to uh, focus specifically on uh, warnings uh, using natural um, signs, right? Because we know that a lot of the events that potentially might occur, as what we've seen in, in this morning, uh, we might not actually get an official warning. We need to know about long or strong get gone. Um, but um, let's, so let's look at um, an, in Thailand. So in Thailand, no official alert was issued out. Um, and Probably a long or strong get gone messaging might not have helped as well because maybe the, the, the earthquake was not as long or strong in some areas. But there were other natural warning signs. 22% reported that they felt an earthquake. 70% saw sea recede, 55% heard sounds, but only 11% evacuated. So this just really highlights that even if we have official warnings or natural warnings, it's not an awareness is not enough. We need to move forward to get people to actually take action, to make decisions that will be helpful and that will protect them. So warning, it's good to have warning systems, it's good to have the warning signs, but we need to think about how do we get people to make those actions to keep them safe. All right, so we look back at um, uh, different studies that look into evacuation behavior. So evacuation is not just for tsunami. We have lots of studies on evacuation from different hazards. So, uh, so why do people evacuate? So people will evacuate if they know that there is a threat, 
But there is also social influences. We've seen how we responded with the pandemic, right? It's not an individual action when we respond to threat. So there are sources of social influences. But the third is also really important, the availability of resources so that we can actually eva evacuate. So I guess this is really important as you start doing your planning and discussions tomorrow. How, what are the resources that we set in place so that we can support people to make those decisions and support people to make those evacuation uh, plans and actions. So evacu evacuation behavior is actually really complex because it's, it involves the humans, it involves social aspects. Okay? It's not simple, it's collective, and it's not individu individualistic. And as we can see in, in, uh, in William's um, modeling, now people don't take only one possible path, there are multiple options for people to choose from when they decide that they want to evacuate. So there's no single answer on how do we make this better. It is a whole system approach. We have to think of these different um, aspects when we're thinking about evacuation behavior. So I'm also bringing up some um, uh, a study from Sally Potter on the factors that make us um, decide to, to do protective action. So as you can see there, there are a lot of that is an aspect of communicating the warning. So we talked about communication earlier, right? So it's important that information sources are are reliable. It's important, important that there are channels that, uh, and preferences that people recognize and trust. It's important on how we communicate the warning messages as well. And of course, there's also environmental cues such as the natural warning signs. But um, as I've emphasized, it's not just the warning itself, but the the characteristic of the person, the receiver of the warning. Could, some, will, some people will be more open to making those decisions. Some people might not be. There are different, um, I guess, characteristics that will influence people's decisions. But also really important is the social cues. If we see others evacuate, will we evacuate along with them? Or, or are we going, are, are, is there going to be contrary behavior when uh, warnings are issued out? These are a lot of questions that we need to ask and consider once we think about evacuation behavior. Right, so this is from um, Graham Leonard, um, a work on how to make effective early warning systems when, within resilient communities. So as you can see, number one, yes, we, did, we do need early warning systems. So this may be your official warning system. It, it can be your natural warning system. But the, the real key thing here is we have to go just beyond the warning system. We need to plan for things. And the third is really important, and I think this is where we're starting doing, doing this conversation. We need cooperation, conversation, discussion, communication among our different stakeholders that are involved in this planning and involved in keeping our community safe. So aside from that, it's the education and participation, and Georgia already kind of mentioned the schools in, in Japan. So it's really important that we also educate and we also get the community to participate in this discussion about evacuation and how to keep themselves safe. And the fifth one is really important, and I will highlight some studies later why this is really important. It's, it's not enough about awareness or just education or communication. We need to practice, we need to exercise, so that when the situation comes, people would know what to do. So these are some of the key things to uh, make effective warning system for resilient communities. So going over some 2011 Tohoku tsunami um, event, and there's some discussion already ar ar around this um, so far. Um, so I want to highlight, because this is what I study, is uh, technology and warning systems, that sometimes we do get over-reliant with technological solutions. And what we have seen in 2011 is, yes, some of the warning systems work and it saved a lot of people, but in some situations, in some areas, these technological solutions might fail. And we have to think about what if they fail? What should we do? What should people do? Uh, is there any other education component that we can help encourage people to make decisions even when technological solutions fail. So what we've seen in Japan is that some large-scale defenses failed and that caused uh, quite devastation, but we've also seen that the warning systems for some situations might not actually work. So really highlighting the importance of prior planning, uh, really important is the evacuation exercises and immediate self-evacuation. So we have heard from Georgia telling that the schools that have done their exercises, they saved the children. And there's also this concept called tsunami tendenko, this, which it translates um, go separately. And this is really encouraging the children to go, not to wait for, is to make that 
decision, uh, make sure that there's no delayed decision, but to go, to go um, separately to safety. And that really, um, in one, uh, I need the name of the city. So in the city of Kamaishi, all the schools were safe because the children knew what to do, is to go safely, uh, to go separately safely. So I really want to highlight the important of, importance of not delaying this decision for evacuation. All right. So now looking back into New Zealand, so let's see how have we fared recently in recent events of uh, the needing to um, evacuate because of, um, of, of tsunami. So let's just uh, look at, um, so, so the good news, okay, there's good news. <laughs> uh, since 2004, there's definitely improved awareness of tsunami risk in New Zealand. So, but there's still some incorrect knowledge or some misinformation about uh, tsunami risk. Um, so, for example, um, some people don't really know um, what's the um, minimum amount of time between a huge earthquake be uh, before tsunami is arriving. And some people are still expecting official warning for local source earthquakes. And there's also um, counterintuitive or detrimental intentions, so um, evacuating by car if you can evacuate by foot. But in some sit situations, evacuating by car might be the actual right decision. But also some people might delay evacuation to seek for more information or gather family members, as uh, was raised earlier, right? So some parents might actually come and get their children. And this is where the planning needs to happen, right? Uh, if, if the parents can trust the schools to make the decisions um, to keep the children safe, safe then um, perhaps that's something that we need we need we need to work on okay so there's also really high awareness of this message and uh, of long or strong shaking um, to to get guns so this is uh, this is a good sign that uh, there's a high awareness um, and this is from the NEMA disaster preparedness survey in 2021 but the, the key thing here is that less than half of the people who live in tsunami hazard zones have practiced evacuating. So it's good that we have good awareness of um, uh, the warnings, um, but uh, there's areas of improvement, and this is where we need to improve on, is to get people to practice. So, um, and this is work from um, Lauren Vinell, which is uh, currently ongoing, looking at how many people um, live in tsunami hazard zones have actually ev uh, evacuated. Okay, so looking at um, the Kaikoura earthquake in 2016, so this is a, a study done in Wellington. Um, so uh, there was a survey conducted in Petoni and Eastbourne. So only one third of the residents surveyed actually evacuated. And only a third of those actually evacuated within the 10 minutes, uh, within 10 minutes. Um, and only 11% actually evacuated because of the, of the earthquake as their natural warning sign. So there's still definitely um, areas of improvement, but what we can see in the recent uh, 5th of March earthquake is that um, another survey, similar survey, was sent out um, to in, in Wellington. So a, still a similar proportion, so not a significant improvement over evacuations, a similar proportion evacuated in Wellington following the 5th of March um, earthquakes. Um, but the good news is most people evacuated immediately. So the, um, uh, people reacted a lot faster and they evacuated a lot sooner than uh, the 2016 uh, Kaikoura earthquake. So this is a good sign, possibly, that there is some improvement over evacuation behavior. All right, so the, um, I just really want to highlight some few things uh, from the social aspects of um, evacuation uh, behavior is that warning systems are good, but they only can activate a certain level of decision making. So the quality of effective warning system really is up to the, the quality of the decision making of people. So what's really important is that we build the capacity to make effective decisions. It, this is the, the key challenge. So it's really important that we have discussions, we have the planning, we have education, and we have the exercises. So these are the, the key, key things. I know it's, it's really hard if we look at the social components. There are many factors to consider, but it is good to start planning and to start having these conversations. So um, what I want to highlight this is, of course, you know, um, it's ongoing. We continue to do the work of research. There's still a lot to do. Um, so on our part as researchers from the Joint Center is that we are still looking at, you know, how people behave from the past and recent events and evacuation. We have international co collaborations because we need to learn from our international 
counterparts. Uh, one thing that we do with also with the East Coast Lab is that we're looking into community and school engagements to improve resilience. Um, and also we work with um, uh, the likes of William on their modeling. We're trying to give them more insights on the um, social science and how that will inform um, their, the modeling for um, evacuation. So we're also looking into you know, um, also uh, social impacts. And this was mentioned earlier this morning about social impacts um, for evacuation and tsunami. So this is an ongoing work. We're looking at um, how first responders and community, what's the effects of evacuation um, on, the, on them. Um, it's an ongoing work. But I just want to highlight a few things about um, social impacts. And this is just um, from studies from the Indian Ocean tsunami, because I think this is something that uh, this group might be interested as well. So some of the social impacts that we can see from tsunami events is, of course, the loss of life and destruction of property and infrastructure. But further on from this immediate loss of um, life and destruction, we will see impacts in livelihood. Um, there's the persistent state of uncertainty. There's also you know, um, community-based um, response and recovery. There will be variations we can see in our communities. But I also want to highlight, and in, in, it was highlighted in, in the discussion earlier, it's about inequities as well. And there's vulner we've seen in Indonesia, India, and Sri Lanka, there's vulnerability in gender and age, but also people with disabilities. Um, they will be quite impacted by tsunami events. Um, we have also to think about um, temporary shelters after events. Um, uh, where will we house people? But also long-term relocation planning, if, that's, uh, if, if, it, if that is within the horizon. So lots of questions, lots of research, lots of work, definitely. Um, and um, yeah, we have to think about um, supporting evacuation for at-risk groups, which I'm very happy to hear some of the discussion earlier that you know we're asking the right questions. What about the people with disability? What about um, other um, marginalized or, or vulnerable groups? Are we also planning for them? That's it. Thank you. <laughs>